So we're going to discuss uh, the un unprivileged user namespace restrictions that uh, landed in Ubuntu 2404 um, and has been a source of problems for several people still. Um, we're still working on cleaning it up. Um, Okay, um, so uh, I will uh, be sorry. I will begin by introducing what are actually uh, user namespace. I'm sure uh, everybody is familiar, but just to make sure. Uh, so user namespace is a way to isolate uh, security attributes for groups of processes. So you can both uh, do user ID, GID, but uh, capability, security, but any security uh, attribute. Um, so, uh, the interest is that different uh, namespaces will be able to have identical, for example, user, uh, user and group ID, and that will not uh, trigger conflict. So, um, in a namespace, the, the processes, uh, a processes can be root, and uh, it's a regular user in the remaining of the whole system. So this was designed as a basic for a containerization. Uh, so that's great. Uh, user namespace have a lot of uh, valid usages, but uh, there is uh, a problem. And uh, the problem is that it uh, increases a lot the attack surface. So um, how do we do to uh, Reduce uh, to to reduce this, and uh, namely how to how to uh, allow a privileged user to sorry how to use a user namespace uh, for a privileged user. Uh, it can be a problem because uh, it can bring a lot of security issues uh, because uh, you then have access to the whole kernel surface associated to user namespace and normally that's uh, a root only. So basically uh, medium priority, for example, it would be only applicable to root for vulnerabilities. Then it's uh, applicable for uh, uh, every processes and it uh, can really increase uh, the attack surface. Uh, we get asked often, is it really a problem? And the answer is yes. This is a subset of the CVEs that uh, have been used with user namespaces. And it's, it's, wor it's a actually a lot worse than this. Um, with, for Ubuntu, like say Pondom, we, we've been participated in that for the last five, six years. Um, every year, they've been used to, to own us. Uh, in 2024, all four exploits that that owned us used user namespaces in their attack chain. 2023, four out of five. Um, Google estimates that 44% of exploit chains are using them. Uh, and if you think about the kernel at large, like syscaller is reporting roughly a thousand plus bugs a year. Now, not all of those are exploitable, and of the exploitable ones, there is a subset of those that are exploitable to user namespaces, but we don't, you know, we, we, we have the ones we know that are exploitable, we have the ones we know that aren't, and there's this whole whack of ones in the middle that they need a lot more analysis to know whether they are, and that, from a distro point of view, makes it so we have to treat those as higher priority than we might otherwise, you know, if it's not exploitable by a regular user, it's, you know, it's something you've fixed, but that's, different than the privilege of escalation that a regular user can use to exploit this and, and get you know, root access. So uh, let's state it differently. What we want to actually do is to prevent untrusted unprivileged user or code base to use unprivileged uh, user namespace to attack the kernel. So, the thing is, we don't want to totally disable uh, user namespace because, okay, that could be a solution, but it's used uh, pretty everywhere and we want trusted code to be able to use them. For example, uh, Firefox or Chrome rely on them uh, to make their sandboxes and 
just blocking user namespace wouldn't make uh, real sense because it would actually reduce the security for this application. Because in this case, uh, user namespace can actually be used to improve the security uh, level of the application. So the problem is not with um, unprivileged uh, user namespace per se, but uh, to, because well configured can be good, but we want to restrict it uh, without breaking uh, too much. So yeah, uh, the thing is make, uh, make um, unprivileged user namespace work uh, without uh, breaking the whole world. So okay, the first solution uh, that is possible and it's to some extent uh, used uh, is to restrict the user namespace creation. Okay, that's something that can be enabled by default in the in the kernel, and then with this restriction, only trusted application, for example, my Firefox or uh, any application that I know uses uh, unprivileged user namespace correctly, can uh, access and use this feature. And these uh, are the only ones that can create unconfined uh, process. So uh, here, unprivileged user, like unconfined, uh, cannot um, create uh, user namespace. So, for example, unshare will not be able to create user namespace, but privileged uh, user will be able to do it. And because uh, we don't want, to, we want the user to be able to choose, there is a global uh, policy variable uh, so that uh, we can choose whether we want to enable it or uh, disable it for the administrator. So here is a, a video about uh, a crash of KDE. So, okay, I will try to add uh, a widget. So the widget uh, actually uses uh, uh, unprivileged user namespace to uh, to work, and then it crashed the, the session. Okay, we have about C, the terminal remains active, so we can type command. But if I try to click on the user interface, it's unresponsive, and even if I log out, I will I won't be able to to log in. So I broke my machine basically. So yeah, that's that's a, a big issue and can be really annoying. Oh, sorry. Um, the thing is, it's not the only one. Like there is a lot of application, and you can see here uh, uh, the the list of bugs that were um, uh, reported to to Ubuntu. Which is a, a huge one and a uh, lot of new, lot of bugs, so we can create uh, profiles. But like, if we don't do anything, uh, many applications will break badly. So yeah. And so the, the breakage on those applications, all those ones under there, uh, that's one of many bugs. Is not just a regular breakage, they're, they're, they're dying with, you know, SIG trap, mm -hmm. SIG seg fault, those type of things. So it's a really poor user experience. So, yeah, how do, does the user namespace are uh, created? Let's take uh, a, a bit, uh, a step back. So basically, I am uh, an application, a regular application that is in the system uh, user namespace. And I will uh, unshare uh, to uh, a new user namespace. So uh, I have my uh, application, which is in a new user namespace, and then I will drop privileges to uh, have something safe uh, for my uh, for my code. The thing is, uh, there is a way to attack because. Um, there is a time window where you can uh, at the attack and you are actually uh, not uh, privileged, but the code that is executed is actually uh, don't know. For example, for unshare, the attacker can execute uh, anything. So he can, for example, not uh, 
reduce his privileges. So it's basically uh, a way to a strong way to, to attack. So the same thing uh, works uh, with clone. So uh, I can clone and I have uh, a new application and uh, similarly, uh, it is possible to, to attack. Um, uh, there is something similar for SetNS, but it's not exactly the same because it's privileged, so it's not under the scope of this presentation. So how to block it? There is two ways. We can either block uh, the unshare, and that's what I showed. So the privileged user will not be able to, to make this unshare, and it's OK. There is another way to protect it, is to let the user make the unshare, but then uh, the new application will be restricted by default uh, into a profile file that will uh, uh, prevent him to, uh, to make capabilities. So that, I okay, I can use the user namespace, but then I cannot make privileged operations, so uh, I reduce the attack surface. And the same, uh, the same uh, thing for, uh, for um, you know, clone. So uh, there is two options, there's two options, have both uh, advantages and drawback. Uh, use, just blocking the, um, the, the user name space is simple, simple uh, to understand. Well, you can see that it will, it is denied. But the thing is, uh, it will break a lot of applications. A lot of applications uh, need this. So, and for the user, it can break unexpectedly. And you can see, you saw on the KDE example that it's not that easy to understand that it was due to user name space. And the other way to, to do it is with capabilities. And then uh, a lot of applications will still work because, uh, for example, some Electron works, uh, Electron apps uh, have, uh, oh, okay, either don't need capabilities or need them, but uh, have a fallback, fallback uh, mode. So in the video, so yeah, they will uh, still work even if uh, uh, it was not possible. The thing is, um, the user may not understand that a capability denial was actually uh, uh, linked to username face. So, yeah. And, yeah, Mac rule can require more rules. So, just to show uh, an example. So, we do the same demonstration than uh, before. The difference is that we block capabilities, and uh, if I try the same thing, it will actually work. So I was able to open the window, uh, even if uh, I had uh, a denial. So yeah, I went to unprivileged user uh, namespace here, and uh, so I made the transition to unprivileged user namespace, and then, um, I check the capabilities, and it was denied. But because KDE has a, a fallback mode for this, it was able uh, it was able to to grasp gracefully fallback. And there is a lot of cases where it's the case. So it's not uh, planned to have a user namespace denied. But uh, in a lot of cases, uh, if uh, the capability is denied, well, we'll have a, a fallback uh, mode, so the crash will be uh, less horrible. And uh, I will, uh, John, go yeah, on the, a second solution about the denying capabilities. All right. <coughs> So instead of a simple just block user namespaces, we're going to use a kind of a hybrid approach. We're going to block user namespaces. We are going to also work with capabilities, and, uh, and not just capabilities. The LSM is finer grain than that. It's all privileged operations. Uh, so again, anything that's using user namespaces has to be in a profile that's going to confine it and, and restrict what it can do. Um, policy is going to mediate the user namespace. It's going to me mediate the other privileged operations. 
uh, the unconfined, if you know AppArmor, we have an unconfined concept. So it's going to, when it, when it tries to execute code that has user namespaces, it is going to transition. This requires a small patch to the LSM that's not upstream yet. It's, it's basically taking and removing a const keyword. Um, so, uh, it, so it's going to transition from to, to a special profile that's going to deny privileges, any, anything that has higher privileges like capabilities. And then we have, a, again, a global policy variable. Now, one of, if, again, for admins to be e easy for them to disable. And one of the tweaks that was made, and uh, we'll get into it later, was it's actually, while it's, it's you know, there for policy, we're not actually enabled in the kernel uh, as default. So this is going to be something that policy is going to uh, set on boot. Um, and it makes it easier for, and we made it easier for admins to do this who aren't familiar with AppArmor policy. Uh, but we actually used a sys control to be able to toggle this Boolean, which is very similar to what was done in the past to disable user na user namespaces. If you know the big global toggle, um, which we still have. Um, so the unprivileged user namespace profile it's just it's 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 going to allow a set of things, it's going to have some things that are, it's denying and saying when on exec, when I hit something, I'm going to also, or not on, I'm, well, I'm, I'm just going to transition my policy. Um, so profile layout with the user conditionals, um, we have kind of two options here. We can, we can have a big giant profile that goes, you know, it's, it's used throughout the life cycle of the user namespace. Like you've got it at the application before the user namespace is created. It remains on the application during the user namespace privileged operations and remains with the application even after the application drops privileges. Um, now, this is not ideal um, and is kind of what we were stuck with without being able to transition at uh, user namespace creation um, ideally, we would could have different profile, different confinement for each stage of that application, right? So pre-user namespace, you have certain confinement. During user namespace, where you have elevated privileges, you have a different confinement. And then post, uh, you have a third confinement. Um, this, would, this would be optimal. Um, dropping privs with user namespaces is not something that is... Uh, friendly to the LSM right now. So we don't have, we've, we've played with this, but within the LSM itself, we don't have any way to properly say we're going to take this and drop privileges and let the LSM know. There, how, how privileges get dropped is there's a set caps, a set PCAP, whatever, uh, that's part of it. There's also, you know, other things that are done like, say, uh, setting no new privs. Uh, and it it's varies on application. Uh, we, we actually need some kind of hooking on the LSM to enable us to actually make those transitions. So we're ending up with, right now, a slightly less than ideal solution where we have, we're going to have policy for something before it enters the user namespace. And once it enters the user namespace, it's going to keep that policy. And we're going to somewhat trust that the elevated privileges of that user namespace, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do the right thing and drop privileges. Now, this is within the process. This is not when it calls out and executes another process. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, and the reason we want those separate profiles, instead of like, say, the first case where we said we could conditionally allow capabilities, um, which would be the left side here, where you say, you know, if we're in the user namespace, versus the right side where we're doing a transition. There's a few things we can do if we do that transition that provide better uh, minimum privilege, least privilege. One of those things you'll see there is we have a, a, an IPC type rule. We're using Unix, allowing Unix sockets to somebody else, right? To some other profile, some other application. In the conditional one, it, we actually can't properly separate that out. Um, we we want to be able to say C can talk to the application if it's not hit those elevated privileges, right? Um, and 
we want to be able to introspect the process as well and say, is it, has it hit those elevated privileges, which the transition gives us, the conditional doesn't. So we get a little bit better if we do this tra transition than just doing a conditional. Um, so it's just, it's just the regular, you know, what we're doing is this, uh, what we were talking about before is the application starts up, it's, it's got a profile, it's, it's got whatever its privileges are, it clones, that clone creates a new user namespace, but it also gets a new restricted profile of some kind. And this is defined by policy, so we are, we're very flexible about how we can do this, whether we're gonna allow the user namespace and deny the capabilities, whether we're gonna just deny the user namespace. Um, and for applications like Firefox and, you know, that, that are using it for their internal sandbox, that's pretty well enough, right? But now we have, in Linux, we have a whole bunch of sandboxing applications, right? They are applications that launch other applications. Um, and some of them are friendly and cooperative with us, and some of them are not. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, some of them will allow the user to, you know, they, they will keep the capabilities entirely within the application. We'll get to that in a sec. Uh, others do not, uh, and they allow all kinds of fun escapes. Um, so say we have a, the sandboxing application, we're in the second phase here where it's created its user namespace, uh, and it's, it's, it's doing the right thing. It's gonna drop privileges, and it doesn't exec. We get a transition. Now that new application, it inherits the user namespace. It's in the user namespace, but we've got a, a profile around that application. It doesn't need access to anything. It's, it, everything's good, right? That, that case is good. Um, we got the next case where we've got an application, a user, a, a sandbox application that is not gonna drop privileges. And this is done in several of them. Um, unfortunately, or it can be an option. So it's like, well, I'm gonna, past the option that I'm not going to drop privileges, right? And in this case, it doesn't exec, and that application now is in a privileged user namespace. It can issue those syscalls that, you know, I'm going to require capabilities, the capability check in the kernel passes, and so now I can attack the kernel with this, right? Um, so this, if, if we didn't uh, have an, if, if we allowed this application, to, to go ahead and do this exec. Why is that not going? Um, it, would, it, it would allow an attack. So you could, you could use that sandbox application to bypass the restriction. And we don't want that, right? It must be confined. The sandbox application must be confined. Its children must be confined. Uh, so they cannot actually bypass the restriction. Now that breaks some use cases. Um, we're gonna block that right there. If it's trying to run something that's unconfined, it has, to, it has to be confined. Now we can, and we do with those, define a pro profile that you're just gonna get. You're gonna be confined regardless. But for things that don't have, for if, if the application that it's calling doesn't have a profile, it will get one that we're forcing on it. Um, if you have a profile, we'll run it with that profile. So. Again, it's confined, it doesn't have access, even if the application didn't drop privileges properly, that, that is the sandboxing application, it's still confined, it can't attack. And in the case where there is a few cases where we want to allow that escape, it's very selective, and again, but the policy is defined in allowing it, and it is there already. And it's only if it already exists and this exception has been called out. Uh, unfortunately, it's needed in a few cases. Um, so this is just kind of like the base idea behind the unshare profile. It's, it's very broad right now. We're going to allow as much as we can, and all we're really doing is we're going to transition when, to a special profile when, when we call our child, right? Um, and the child gets a different profile, and that profile doesn't have the, the broad privileges. Uh, same idea kind of happened with BRAP where BRAP is doing a little bit more. It's, it's, it has to do a little bit more because bubble wrap will use no new privileges and no new privileges tickle some things in the kernel differently uh, that, that can trip things up. So there's some, an extra layer there that's uh, not, not to be worried about. It's doing the same basic thing. It's just 
dealing with a, a, a no new privileges. Um, but if we just did straight up bubble wrap profile like that for confinement, well, bubble wrap will break flat pack. Um, and flat pack, well, if you know flat pack, you know it's using bubble wrap for its confinement story. Um, but it is actually not a great citizen there, um, unfortunately, it turns out. Because there is cases where Flatpak allows bubble wrap to do things it really shouldn't do. Um, and, but it comes down to we need bubble wrap, when it's called, to be called differently so when, when, when we hit Flatpak. So this is one of the things we've ran into is we can't just have a simple, you know, we're going to use bubble wrap and here, here's it, bubble wrap's confinement. We actually have to have different use cases and say, when bubble wrap is being used from flat pack, we're going to do something different than when bubble wrap's being called by a regular user. When bubble wrap is called by steam, well, it's, it's pressure vessel in steam, but basically bubble wrap. Um, it, you know, again, we do something different. So there's cases where we, we come around and, and to make this work and not completely break the world, we have to be able to uh, have unique situations that you know, we can call out and enumerate. And so this is, uh, if anybody followed the capabilities stuff on the LSM mailing list, why I said that just doing it at the capabilities level isn't sufficient. It gives you an inheritance hierarchy that, that's great for blocking all the children, but it doesn't handle the, the broader case of, we don't want these actually enabled by default at, and let any user use them, at least at the distro level, but that is what the standard Linux is now. Um, and there's no way for the capability model that, that is we're gonna follow Linux capabilities and just take it away and then the hierarchy down will work for all these situations. Um, so Flatpak, like I said, it's, it's, it, it does define its policy and Flatpak is responsible for making a policy. So it's not like the user can just pass any options to the bubble wrap. Uh, command, but it still actually does let some applications run with privileges at times. Um, we still have to look into this. And uh, general principle, that, you know, this is a general principle about not just bubble wrap, but all of these sandboxing commands is we have to deal with special cases. SnapD is a little bit better citizen than Flatpak for really two reasons. Um, but it's, it's the same kind of story. For, uh, so SnapD1, this is one of the advantages of a closed store, I suppose. The applications all, they have to go through review. They have a, a declarative policy that they set up. And so when the application is allowed things and SnapD added um, a, what they call an interface for use of user namespaces. And it's a privileged interface. Applications that want to use it have to go through review. So what it comes down to is SnapD isn't going to let anybody, just anybody add anything, and it's hard to sideload stuff on snaps. Where Flatpak, it, one of its virtues is it allows, you know, the flat hub and allows people to put whatever in. But again, when you're trying to block these, it's, it becomes a vector for people to just bypass the restrictions. Um, so what are some issues we've hit, right? Uh, out of archive code, um, there's a lot of applications I mean, that are not in the archive. I mean, we have a huge archive. We have, uh, I don't remember what it is, between main and universe, we have 50,000 apps, something like that. Um, but there's actually an awful lot that aren't in the archive. And we can ship policy for some of these things that aren't in the archive, or we even have versions in the archive, but then there's upstream versions as well, right? So if you think about Steam, we ship a Steam, and it's shipped as a snap, but most people are using the Steam client straight from Valve. Um, Firefox, same idea. We ship a, a Firefox, but there's an awful lot of people downloading Firefox. So we can ship profiles for well-known ones like that, um, but we can't ship it for everything that's out of archive. Um, applications that have user-writable locations. If you have a user-writable location, uh, somebody who wants to attack the system and use user namespaces, they can just 
if, if, you're, if you're allowing running something confined and access to user namespaces as a user writable location, so say a, a user puts it in their bin folder, right? And says, I'm gonna set up a profile for that. Well, an attacker says, well, that location's not protected. I can overwrite what they put in their bin and now I can run and use user namespaces and attack the kernel. So we can't allow write, user writable locations at least at the distro level, right? Um, we can allow users to selectively enable that on their systems that they're taking the, the risk then, but really it's not such a risk for just the user because it's not something an attacker or an application really can expect then, right? Um, app images. If you know anything about app images, this is where they run, right? Most people have app images, they download them, and they run them straight from their home directory. So does this break all, all app images? It doesn't, right? But if you know anything about app images, there's an awful lot of app images that are Electron apps. Um, Electron apps, they embed a web engine, and that web engine actually uses unprivileged namespaces for its sandbox. Uh, now, ideally, we don't want to break that sandbox, right? We, that sandbox, if that web engine can be trusted, is good, but we don't know it. We just, we, there's no way for us to know that at the distro level, right? So we have to stop that. We can't allow it. Um, and it's really unfortunate. Um, we had an interesting situation where we've also had upstreams, and this was not malicious, but a malicious one could do this as well, uh, have tried to circumvent the restriction. So they have a bug, things are failing, they wanna make it work. Uh, a solution gets passed around on the internet, and they're like, oh great, this is a solution, test it on their stuff. And they're like, great, we can do this. Um, and so they have this bug, we've got a solution, and we're a deb-based package. Well, we can ship some policy in our deb, because debs can do anything, they have root privileges. So we're gonna install some policy on the system that fixes our problem. Only problem is that policy they're installing actually allows bypassing the restriction for all users of bubble wrap. Um, so uh, we need integration testing to make sure that those kind of things aren't happening, aren't slipping into the archive to disable the restriction at the distro level. Um, and finally, well, users really do not understand. It's like, I just want my application to work. It worked before, right? And it, it's hard to say no. <laughs> in those cases, and so we have tried to provide a way for users to selectively disable and make it easy for users. Um, there's a there's a, a escape patch profile a template that's been passed around that says basically, this application can do, behave like it's unconfined, right? Uh, it's what it was before, there's no, there's, there's restrictions not there. Um, we're not doing anything, right? Um, and it's, it's, a, it's an okay solution, but it's still too hard for users. Uh, we talked about a little bit about app images. Maxime's gonna talk some more about app images. So, yeah, um, for uh, the average user, uh, well, you don't understand what happened. Uh, you have a crash and, well, uh, it's uh, either a sick trap or a capability denial or uh, something that, uh, uh, without uh, being an expert, you won't know that it's caused by uh, um, uh, user namespaces. And also, most users are totally unfamiliar with, uh, with Aparmor. So the, the way of shipping a profile can be uh, a solution, but for most users, it won't be practical. And just, uh, yeah, just to, to say that, I have an Electron app that should work, and in, in all tutorial it works, but then it didn't, and if I uh, look on the mesh, well, uh, I saw uh, that I um, uh, make the transition to a privileged profile, but then just uh, I had a capability denial to a privileged uh, um, sorry, to, cap, uh, to sysadmin, and then a sick trap, uh, and the, the message is not really helpful, so yeah. Sorry. 
So what do we want to do? Um, if we have a, a, a user namespace that is denied, we want a way to make user-friendly notification so that the user understands properly what happened and he can choose to whether to add uh, the creation of user namespace or not for this uh, program individually. So we want it to make uh, to be as easy uh, as possible. We don't want uh, notification flooding, and we don't want it to be uh, abusable by uh, malicious users uh, with a, a graphical interface that is integrated. <coughs> so we do that uh, by AA Notify. So AA Notify is a tool that uh, already existed. Uh, so it runs as um, a background task and it will show when a user namespace is denied. And we created new, uh, new user-friendly graphical interface in the new version so that the user is able to make uh, appropriate actions to add uh, he wants with an interface that is at our time about, so integrable uh, in this rows. So we pull notifications. Uh, we can filter uh, uh, operation to have only user namespace create, and uh, we can um, show graphical uh, notification for uh, uh, splash notification when a, a uh, something uh, user namespace is denied. So basically, how it works uh, when a user namespace is denied, uh, I will have uh, a window uh, that will tell me, uh, okay, I have a notification. I can have more info on why it happened, uh, what should I do, and uh, if I want, uh, I will have to type my password to allow it, and if I allow, I allow it, I'm able to, to run it. So I have a quick demo about this. So I um, will uh, remove uh, unprivileged user namespace to, to show straight uh, denial because it's easier. I started um, AA Notify, so this, uh, this software, and uh, I tried to make a user namespace, which is uh, denied. That is to be expected. Yep, sorry, I restarted the demo. Okay, <laughs> so again, I start AA Notify. Uh, my answer is denied, and a notification is deployed. So uh, I can allow it, I type my password, and up, a profile has been created for Unshare. So now Unshare works, and I can check uh, if I type my ID, I am nobody, so I am in a new uh, user namespace. I was uh, in a normal one before. So uh, let me remove uh, this, the profile I created to go to the back uh, to the previous uh, state. And uh, I make a splash notification so that it's easier for the, uh, for the user. And then uh, when I have a denial, I already have a pop-up screen that uh, tells me what to do. I can have more information. And if I want, allow or deny uh, the, 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 uh, the user next space. And it will work. So, uh, user applications are not the only issue. LXD is uh, kind of like sandboxing uh, uh, applications on steroids. Um, so LXD, because of what it's trying to do right now, it just goes through and it's disabling user. If, if it's installed, it disables user namespace, well, not installed. If it's running, it's going to disable user namespace restrictions globally. Um, and that's unfortunate. We need to fix that, right? Um, well, every policy, every, every container with LXD actually does have a policy namespace. Um, and with old contain and there's there's potential to do something here, right? Um, we don't want the restriction necessarily being applied to old old containers uh, because that would you know break the old container. Like policy on a on a 2004 system has not been updated to account for the user namespace restriction. So if you're running a container against a, our kernel, you know a new kernel and it's being applied, it's going to break. So Running 
containers of older operating systems does allow bypassing. Now, this is somewhat mitigated by the fact that LXD is, you have to have the LXD group, and that's basically root. Um, and people aren't in the, that group by default. So, so what we have, you know, LXD, it's running a 2404 host, say, and it wants a 2004 container, like I said. Um, we don't want to break that, right? Right now, without disabling it, we do. Um, so with the kernel, like I said, it's available. It, we're, we're disabled at boot, right? Um, so the, the 2404 container, the 2004 container, when it comes up on a kernel, if it's disabled, it's going to be fine. Um, but say we we do something different, right? Uh, well, I, as I said, uh, we'll get there. Um, LXD, like I said, it's toggling it on and off at runtime. Um, so that makes it so the 2404 container works. Uh, Unfortunately, say we uh, bring up a 2404 container on a 2404 system, well, the 2404 container, because it has its own policy and there's a global toggle, right? It comes up, it's boot, it's, it toggles that Boolean, it enables the user namespace restriction stuff in the kernel, and it ends up breaking the 2004 container. <laughs> Uh, because the 2004 container doesn't know how to deal with it, right? Um, it's fun. Um, so how do we, we we fix that? We'll get to that. We got more fun though. We also use new kernels on old releases, right? We we take our uh, 20, 2404 kernel and we put it back on 2204 to provide device support and stuff for those kernels. Um, so it's not enabled by default in the 2404 kernel, so 2204 is not going to trigger that. So that works until, you know, we load a 2404 container on a 2204 host, and then it's worse than breaking one container, it actually breaks the host. <laughs> um, so how do we fix this? We need to virtualize that uh, variable. So instead of being a, a global policy variable, it's done at a policy namespace. LXD already cooperates. It sets up a policy namespace. Um, this does require cooperation for the container manager. So if any other container manager was to use this, they would have to cooperate as well and set this up properly. Um, so now if we virtualize on a 2404 host, it, we can run either. They both get their own set of policy restrictions. The 2404 container is acting like a 2404 with the restrictions enabled. The host is acting like the restrictions enabled. And the 2004 container is has the restrictions disabled. Yes, the 2404 container can then be used to attack the host kernel, but that's the nature of using LXD. Uh, same works if we take the new kernel back to 2204. The host comes up with the policy restriction disabled. The host is fine. The container manager sets up the policy namespace to, to, virtual, to, to have that restriction. Um, it boots the 2404 container works as if the container, as, as if the restriction's there, the policy works. So, and it doesn't break the host. So, what did we learn for, through all this? It's a pain in the butt. Um, we uh, added confinement over that, that allows various confinement that around user namespaces to over 120 applications in the archive. Um, that covers just about everything uh, that we know of right now, uh, but it certainly doesn't cover everything out of tree. Um, like I said, we are shipping a few profiles for a few applications, special applications like Steam and Firefox that are regularly downloaded from uh, the uh, trusted upstream. Uh, uh, we, we carry most of these special profiles or the modifications of profiles in a regular policy, but there are several applications that are actually carrying it as part of their policy. There's actually a lot in the KDE stuff, partly because how KDE embeds WebKit. Um, Flat packs right now are all treated as one in that count. Um, we still need to do a lot of work to refine flat packs. In the end, flat packs are going to 
be a, a very large expansion on that. And SnapD, we're not counting SnapD. All the snaps that use it, they have policy that's generated. And uh, there's not many snaps using this right now, but it's, it's handled within SnapD and it, it just works. And I don't know what the numbers are. Um, so, you know, there's security issue. Uh, it's not a perfect solution right now, but we can't allow user namespaces and have a perfect solution. Uh, as Linus said, when, you know, this got heated on the mailing list, uh, we're stuck with these now and we have to do what we can to make them work the best that we can. And uh, we're still working towards some things to try to improve this. And it, like I said, experimenting with adding transitions at when privileges are dropped, for example, uh, that's still going to take a, a fair bit of work to do. Uh, but that's where we're at at the moment. Yeah, Paul. I can hear you. It is. Um, so, uh, yeah. So Paul's asked uh, if the small patch to the LSM that's needed is to the user namespace creation hook, and the answer is yes. And I have that patch. I just have to send it up. And. No. Okay, so Paul just asked if it's because we want to modify the capabilities. And the answer to that is within, that, within the user namespace LSM hook. And the answer to that is no, we don't. What we want to do with the user namespace hook is right now it sets the cred as const. Um, and, we, and this is during the cred creation phase when the cred's actually not in use. I mean, you saw this actually with the capability patch set as well that's been floating around. The, all the patch to the LSM does is change that so the const is not there, making it valid for us to change the cred in the hook so we can update the app armor context on that cred before it gets attached to the process. Um, and then where, where we're stuck right now is I just need to finish up cleaning up these, the app armor patch that we're going to send upstream with this one. Um, it, it, there's a, there's a, a split there that we there is some other stuff we want to do after follow on that needs uh, further stuff, but a clean first patch to get that into the kernel is where we're at is what we need. Any other questions? All right, thank you.